Okay, welcome back. Uh, I'm just going to try and present the notes so I don't have to look into my other notes. So just... <laughs> Can everyone see this? Is it clear? But is it clear enough or? Oh, okay. But oh, just hold on. Oh, it's too. Okay, so let's get into the spiritual dynamics. Um, chapter six, spiritual dynamics of urban centers. Uh, before I go ahead, any questions, any thoughts, anyone? Any questions, any thoughts? Ah, okay, that is uh, pastors, uh, Pastor Ashish. He had, um, during his early days when he was in the US, he went to Kabul to uh, to kind of scout the land to, to do some ministry there. And then also APC Derlakate. So before Mangalore, uh, Derlakate is in Mangalore, uh, but in 2001, he had gone to Derlakate to, to like start something there. So it was all through like a worship thing. And then APC Delakari started. So again, those days, <laughs> those days, I don't know how uh, how he managed that, but uh, yeah. So so he's probably just going to like to share. He shared the examples of those two of how he went about uh, ministering. That. Okay, spiritual dynamics of urban centers. <laughs> Okay, so we looked at natural dynamics, right? We looked at um, uh, you know the different aspects. Uh, so keep this in mind, even as you plan to maybe plan to church, plan a ministry. Remember the natural dynamics that uh, that are prevalent in that place. Now let's look at um, urban city spiritual dynamics in of urban centers. Now. We know that God is at work in whether it's cities, towns, villages, God is at work. God has a heart for nations. He, you know, the scriptures teach us, ask of me and I will give you the nations. This is not just a verse that we can, you know, just, uh, just because it's there and everyone say it, so we also say it. No, it's not just a feel good verse. This is God's promise, right? Ask of me and I'll give you the nations. Meaning, you, you, you want to minister to the nations? You ask me. I will open the doors for you. Right? So God is at work in our cities. But uh, remember that where God's work is, the enemy is also working. And the enemy can use any tool possible to destroy the work of the ministry, to destroy people. The Bible says that he, the enemy, he comes but to kill, steal, and destroy. That's his only agenda, right? So where, when we know that God has a, a plan for the city, if God is calling us for a city to plant a church, to do a ministry in the city, we must also be aware that there's an enemy that is trying, that will try to stop us. There's an enemy that is that will bring all kinds of demonic activities that can not only stop us, but can also influence the city, the people around as well. Satan attempts to pervert God's design for the city. Right? We must understand this. God's design for the city is what? I will bless you. Right? I will bless you as a nation. If you come to me, uh, if you read all through the Old Testament, he's speaking to Israel, he's saying, even though I bring judgment, 
even though I have broken you, even, ever, even though I have hurt you, you come back to me, I will heal you. I will bind you up. I will call you my children, just as, a, just as an eagle calls his eaglet back and looks after it. The same way, I will look after you. So God's heart for the city, when God looks at, so very important, when God looks at us, at, looks at a city, it's not like God is angry with the city. God is like waiting to pour judgment on that city. That's not how God looks at it. When God looks at people in a city and he looks at the sin, his heart goes out for that city. He wants, that's why you know he says, you know, the, the, the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. He wants people to come to know about him. That's his desire. All through the Old Testament, why did God send prophets? God could have just kept quiet, no? No need any prophet. Let them do what they want. First of all, I brought them out of Egypt. They saw all the miracles. They know I am God. And now I have to send prophet. One prophet to northern Israel, one prophet to southern Israel. I have to tell them something. I have to tell south something. They're turning away from God. Again, I have to send one more prophet. Prophet after prophet after prophet. Why did God do that? Because God has a heart for the nation. He had a heart for Israel. If you see, uh, was God angry with the sin of the people of Israel? Yes. But did he love Israel? Yes. Because he says in so many places, he says, I've made a covenant. I've made a covenant. If not for my covenant, I would have finished you off. But I made a covenant. So I intend to keep that covenant. So when God looks at a city with all the sin, with all the filth, with all the demonic activities that are happening, God's heart breaks for the city. And God wants people. He needs laborers to go out and bring a change in the city. So what is Satan's attempt? He wants to pervert everything. He wants, to, he wants people to disbelieve the gospel. He wants people to feel that, you know, we don't need Jesus. There is no Jesus. He wants people to feel that, you know, uh, uh, you know, he can use politics. He can use leaders. He can use uh, money. He can use fame. All of this to get away from God. He can use all of it. And how long will it take for a person to, you know, if you say, I'll give you all the money in the world, just deny God. It's very easy, especially in cities, people struggle. Well, they want to have lavish lives. They want to have good lives. Nothing wrong in that. But if I want to have a lavish life denying Christ or turning my face away from Christ and trying to do all the evil things there, that is of no use. Right? But the enemy uses these things. He can use music. He can use culture. He can use, of course, all these um, uh, you know, demonic activities like drugs and alcohol and uh, you know, uh, the, uh, social media is another big influence. Not only is it, we know that social media is you know, wonderful for the church. It, so it's, it's good that we have social media, but there are many, many, many bad effects of social media. Because the enemy takes it and he perverts it. Right? That's what he did to Adam and Eve. God created Adam and Eve. He perverted. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, life came through Adam, sorry, death came through Adam, but life came through the Son of Man who came from heaven. Death came because of sin. Life came because of Jesus Christ. Right? So what, whatever God designs, whatever God makes, the enemy wants to pervert it. He wants to either pervert it or destroy it. Look at a few examples. Revelations chapter 2 and verse 10, the church in Smyrna. Let's read that. Revelations 2 and verse 10. Go ahead. Uh, Revelation 2.10 Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, 
the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Yeah. Sorry. So, the church is small now. Can we read that again once again, please? I was just uh, trying to do something here. Can you read it once again, please? Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Mm. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. Right. So in the book of Revelations, all these churches, the seven churches in Asia Minor, now, the Lord Jesus is speaking to those seven churches, but the, the message is not only for the seven churches. It is for all churches, even the churches now. It says here, there's a presence of a group that belongs to Satan. Now, Jesus is saying this. Think of this. Church of Smyrna, you are faithful. You're a good church. right? You, you have been obeying me. You follow me. You do what I tell you to do. There are some of you who are very, you know, you, you're a very good, you're obeying God, you're, a, you're a following everything that you have to do, living a holy life, but there's a presence of a group of people that belongs to Satan. And what are they trying to do? Jesus is saying they're in the church. A group of people who belong to Satan are in the church. And these people, this group is trying to bring perversion, trying, trying to bring division, trying to bring hatred, fear, jealousy, strife, all of these things. This presence of a group of, that belongs to Satan. They're trying to do this in the church. Now, interestingly, Jesus is not stopping it. Jesus knows it. What does he say? The devil is also going to cause some of you to be put into prison. So some of you, for your faith, will be put into prison. So don't think that everything is going to be all right. You may find very, very challenging time. You may be beaten and put into prison, but have faith even to the end. That's God's word. But the Lord Jesus is saying, there's a group of people who belong to Satan. They're trying to whip up all kinds of... Uh, things within the church, disunity, arguments, whatever they're trying to do. They may also take you and put you into prison, but you, as believers, stand firm till the end. So what does it teach us? It teaches us that, you know, Satan is not only outside. He can also penetrate within the church, inside of the church. Let's read the next one, Church in Pergamos. Revelations chapter 2, 13 and 14. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells, what I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality? Mm. Listen to that. Now, in the first church, Jesus is saying, see, so you stay faithful to the end. There's a group of people. Some of you are you know, obedient. You're uh, you know, following the precepts of God, you're living a holy life, but there's a group of, uh, you know, people who are from Satan, they're going to put you into prison. That's the first church. The second church, Jesus is being too direct. He's saying what? It is a place where Satan's throne is and Satan dwells. That means in the church, in that place, Satan's throne is established. When we say throne, that only means his his authority is there. Outside, what does it look like? It looks like a church. Yeah, hey, I'm going to church. But there, Satan's throne and is, is established and Satan dwells there. The doctrine of Balaam is infiltrating the church. 
false doctrines, false prophecies, lies, manipulation, cheating, all of this. Now, listen, this is happening within the church. So Jesus is saying, get rid of it. I have this against you. Right? Imagine Satan has entered in. He has perverted what the church is supposed to be. He's made it this way. So we must be very careful. Thirdly, church in Thyatira, chapter 2 and verse 20. Let's read that. Nevertheless, I have few things against you, because you allow that woman, Jezebel, who call herself a prophetess, and teach and beguile my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, again, in this church, again, there's a condemnation. What is Jesus saying? I have one thing against you. Everything else is okay, what you are doing. But one thing is against you. You, are, you tolerate the spirit of Jezebel. Right? That is at working in the church. Now, what is if you go back and read about Jezebel, the word Jezebel, so she was a Baal worshipper, a Phoenician woman. And she was a woman who was totally against the God of Israel. A powerful woman. Imagine Elijah is standing in front of 400 prophets of Baal and says, come on, let me see who's going to win this contest. He wins the contest. Next chapter, he's running away from this one woman. Because she was somebody who was against everything that the God of Israel was. And her attributes have entered the church. Right? And, and it's working in the church. Her, the spirit of Jezebel, sexual immorality, idol worship, right? hatred, all of these things she's bringing into the church. Who's doing this? The enemy. Right? And Jesus is aware of it. Thirdly, fourthly, the church in Philadelphia. Let's read Revelation chapter 3 and verse 9. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogues, a synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Mm. Now, this is a nice, uh, really nice thing Jesus is saying. See, as a church in Philadelphia, you, you are a good church. But there's a presence again, a group of people who belong to Satan. But here's what I am going to do. I'm going to make those people who belong to Satan come and bow down before your feet. So Jesus is saying, you, are, you have the authority. And I'm going to make them come and bow down. So the work of the enemy is not going to affect the church. It's not going to affect the people. It's not going to affect the congregation. The, the people who are trying to cause us to are following the enemy, they will bow down before you. Allegorically speaking, meaning the devil, the works of the enemy shall bow down to the church. Remember what Jesus said? I've given you the authority to trample over snakes and scorpions. I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So when you look at this, we see that the enemy can and will infiltrate. Look at the churches right now. I have read many, many, many articles about churches. And it's some of them have been very beautiful, wonderful churches who have really stood for the Lord. But there are some churches which are really, um, I would say, it's just going out of the line. And these are very famous churches. Very famous churches. We all know them. Globally, people, you know, are listen to them, listen, listen to the preachers, listen to their songs. But we must be careful. Because the enemy has infiltrated the church. And there was this one message recently, I was listening to it. One of these new uh, churches, the 
Um, but again, mega church. You know, I don't know how they they start off and then in one year they're a mega church. I really don't know how, you know, but that's what it is. And um, so this pastor is a young man, maybe in his early, uh, late 30s, early 40s. He's preaching and he's preaching, he's preaching all kinds of things. It's not even relevant to the scripture. Like he has brought, you know, some food and he's eating noodles uh, and he's trying to, like, he's using that as an allegory to, to, you know, to just as an example to bring out from the Bible, from his message. Then he's got some other things and, and it was all like, you know, snacks and chips and cake and all around. And he's, I don't know what he did. So almost 20 minutes went in that, oh, I like chips. I like the biscuits. I like the, and he's got all of it. Around. And there are thousands of people who are listening to this. In those thousands of people, many of them are going through heartbreaks, going through challenges, going through difficulties, need healing, need deliverance. And the entire sermon, I, I really don't know what happened in the end. It just, he said, okay, Stan, let's do the song in the end. And they closed. Thousands of people. I thought to myself, you see how the enemy can bring in. He didn't even open the Bible. Probably used a few verses. But the enemy can infiltrate. Now, uh, I would say this, you know, now the enemy is no more going to, you know, to, uh, through these small, you know, small problems. He's targeting the leaders right on top. So when he targets the leaders, the whole thing crumbles. So especially as leaders, we need to be aware. We need to be on high alert. That's why Paul writes in Ephesians 6, he says, you put on the armor of God. I preach the word in season. Preach the word out of season. Whether you like it, whether you don't like it, preach the word. Meaning stay in the word. Stay focused on the word. Right? We see spiritual beings influencing natural leaders over cities. Let's read First Chronicles 21 and verse 1, where David is, uh, First Chronicles 21 and verse 1. And then maybe someone else can open Isaiah. Uh, okay, but that's the entire passage. So no, just read First Chronicles 21 and verse 1. Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. Yeah. So again, it says that Satan tried it. And we look at Babylon, right? The enemy came and you know caused so much of confusion, so much of uh, problems and uh, idol worship, uh, idolatry, immorality in Babylon. So if you read Isaiah in the book of Isaiah, all through chapter 1 through chapter 39 is only God's judgment upon the people. Why? Because you have turned away from me. You have fallen. You have following the enemy you are literally worshiping the enemy so ch turn away from your ways and, and then jeremiah again the weeping prophet god is telling jeremiah tell the people that there's going to be a uh, destruction tell the people to change their ways only then i will turn my heart towards them uh but it you know but then later on Things change for Jeremiah. So Satan attempts to pervert God's design for the city. And so for us, it'll be useful to know what God is already doing in the city. What are the demonic strongholds and the areas that are, uh, you know, of their concentrated activity in the city? Meaning, what is the enemy trying to do? Now, very important. Listen very clearly. We are not trying to put all our focus on the enemy. We are not doing a deep study about what the enemy is doing. No. We are just getting an overview of what the enemy is doing. Example, in the early church, when the Apostle Paul went to uh, Athens, Acts 17, he goes to Greece. What does he do? He walks around and he sees... He sees the temples. He sees the, 
different kinds of gods that have been structured by people's hands. And also he saw there's a to an unknown God. Now he got a he got a feel of what's happening. He knew that this city, people are religious, but they don't know God. And they don't know who God is. So they're just following whatever they feel like following. Remember, we learned this in lifestyle evangelism where you've got the Stoics and the Epicureans. They had different belief systems. They were religious. It's just that they didn't know who the God is, who the real God is. So Apostle Paul, he understood what's happening there. Why are they, you know, uh, even in Ephesus, there was a temple of Artemis, right? Uh, the goddess of uh, lust and sexual immorality with thousand prostitutes, male and thousand female prostitutes. Now he understood the city. The reason is because it's a harbor. There are people there. There are. Uh, this is what was happening in this place, sexual immorality. So he knew that he had to, the way to penetrate through the city, he had to find you know, a certain way to penetrate. So when we understand what's happening, we will be able to, you know, God will give us the wisdom to penetrate and to be able to uh, plant a ministry or a church in that city. Right? Again, what are some of the things? Culture expressed in many ways, that is through art, dance, uh, festivals, customs, superstitions. Right? Now, especially superstitions are many. When I went to, I think it was Varanasi, we were we got off the uh, the airport and we were going. I don't remember who I was with, but we were going, and all of a sudden, uh, a cat passed by. This guy stopped, and he's not going. I'm saying go. I'm tired. I want to go to the you know to the room and just rest. It's not good. He got down, he went around that vehicle three, four times. So what happened? He said, no, the cat went by. No, The cat is minding his own business. He wants to go that side for food or whatever it is. But he stopped. For 20 minutes, he did something. He went round and round. And superstitions. There's another superstition, especially you know in villages, where uh, if, if the first child is a son, it's a grand celebration. Well, it's something that, oh, wow, it's a son. Right? And they normally dedicate that son to their gods, whoever their god is. Right? Uh, and that's why we see that you know, many times, many, many times, I've noticed this when it comes to uh, in villages and towns where there's a lot of demonic activities, the first child normally dies. It is. It is normal. It is. It's a common occurrence because the enemy is working. He wants to. He 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 doesn't care. Also, oh, sad uh, first child. Now let it be born. He doesn't care. His kill, steal, destroy. That's all his target is. Right. So there are many cultures, uh, and some of those cultures we can we can adapt to. Right. So, for example, you know, women and men sit separately in North India, or they take off their footwear. That's okay. All of that is not important. Uh, if dance is something that people like, you can incorporate dance within the church. Nothing wrong, right? Uh, singing, whatever it is, uh, incorporate their culture to within the church as well. But remember that their culture should not affect what's happening in the church, right? Now, in a certain culture, if they like dance and festivals, all of it, it doesn't mean that they do whatever they did before becoming believers, they can come and do in the church. No. Right? You, you must be aware of what's happening. Then you look at uh, social geography. You look at moral values, um, uh, addictions. Again, same thing that we looked at, uh, this suicide rate, corruption, crime rate. and very importantly, the major needs to be addressed in the city. Now, mostly in most places, uh, especially in cities, we have something called as NGOs, right? Where they they work in helping out these underprivileged or these areas of society. So, for example, we have NGOs that help homeless children. 
we have NGOs that help uh, children who are prostitutes, uh, you know, children who are whose parents or uh, whose mothers are prostitute, and they're still engaging in that, but they need to be looked after. Then we have NGOs who look after slum children. Right? I remember we have one of our church folks, uh, she has an NGO, and her NGO was to look after slum children. Very, very, very poor children, poor families. They have nothing. They, you know, just hand to mouth. They get a meal good. If they don't get, it's okay. So these children, these uh, what they do is this NGO, they go to these slums and they get all the boys together right the men get all the boys the girl the women get all the girls together and what they do is they get the boys interested in a sport right so for example this ngo uh, they got the boys interested in football so as an ngo what they did is they brought they bought about 15 20 footballs some jerseys and some shoes so uh, basic needs and said, okay, everyone, you'll come to this ground. They probably book a ground or any of the public uh, parks or grounds. Everyone will come. You come early morning, six o'clock. We'll give you shoes. We'll give you jerseys, everything. You come and play. Now tell me, will the children like it or not? Like, That's something nice you know, for them. Oh, so and so they come. And they play football six to seven. You know, they may not even know the game so well, but they play. And as they play, we, you know, they give them, of course, snacks or breakfast. And over time, slowly begin to minister to them, show them the love of Christ. And it's a brilliant uh, ministry. You know, they they did it. They, they they are so effective that at one time they had 150, 200 children making teams everywhere, and. Uh, they, all they did was played football and you know minister to people and through that many many young boys gave their life to christ they got a job they began to work some of them became football coaches and they began to work in the ngo helping other children uh, and it's such a beautiful thing and the women would uh, do tailoring classes or art and craft art and crafts uh dance whoever's interested i get them into that so that their mind is not saying okay you know what my mother is working here my mother is a prostitute or my my father is a drug addict or alcoholic fallen so their mind is taken away from all of that right so these kind of ngos will be there that are helping out and what you can do is as your ministry grows you can join with them so apc what we do is uh, we used to, but now the ministries, they, they have others. So uh, what we used to do is we used to go, and I remember, right, I used to go early, uh, maybe about 8 o'clock in the morning, and these boys will come, right? Uh, young boys, all like maybe 15, between 15 to 20, 25, within 25 years old. All of them are sweating. Right, with their football jerseys and all that, they're all come and they're but they're all come and they're sitting. And we used to do who we are in Christ. We did uh, faith, praise, and worship. We just teach them, just 20, 30 minutes. And they all will sit. They all will listen. Right? Because they knew there was something, something that is empty in their heart. This gospel, this ministry is fulfilling it in their heart. Right? And and it's so wonderful to see that. So you can partner with these kind of NGOs over time, right? Um, here's a question: Think of some examples where you observe something expressed in the natural in the city, which is indicative of certain spiritual spiritual dynamics over the city. How does making such observations help you develop a strategy for ministry? towards that area right so for example so the question is basically think of certain examples that you observe in a city certain natural dynamics that you see in the city and and how will you develop a strategy for that ministry so for example we see in bangalore 
the suicide rates is the highest in the entire nation. Can you believe that? In a city where there's so much available, I think anyone can survive in Bangalore. Yes or no? Right. Anyone can get a job. Anyone can work. You can survive. It's not very hard. Right. But Bangalore has the highest suicide rate in the entire nation. It's sad. We are called the IT hub. We have a great economy, you know, great buildings and IT center, but highest in suicide rate in our nation. So what can, now we know that suicide rate is the highest, mostly age ranging from maybe 15 to 30, right? Uh, and also maybe even, maybe 15 to even 40. Right? Now, how can we solve this problem? Recently, somebody showed me, sent me a video. It was just quite a graphic video where this school, the school children are are going out of school, and I think one of the shop cameras saw that, captured it, and and so the, it was a girls' nursing school or nursing college, maybe. And they are walking, and one of the girls randomly, just from her bag, took out a knife and started poking herself on her throat, just constantly. And she fell there and she died. A life gone in a few minutes. And the friends were asked, what happened? They said, I don't know. We were going home after school, after, no, after the classes. We were just walking home. We were laughing and talking and walking home. I don't know why she did this. So you see what's happening in a city like Bangalore. So much of crowd, so many friends and everything is there, but people are still lonely. How can we as a ministry reach out? Right. Maybe I'll ask some of you, what, what is, uh, Francis, what is something in Kerala that you feel is a problem? Alcohol? Okay. Yeah. Is it there in Bangalore? Yes, but not as much as maybe Kerala because here it's more of suicide. What about uh, Nikhil? Oh, idol worship. Okay, so we know that's a that's a prevalent thing that's happening there. And through idol worship, there's a lot of demonic activities that happen. Chira, Assam. Drugs. Okay. It's very easy to get drugs. So now it's a problem because children also are able to get young age, 15 years old, lesser than 15 years old, 12, 10, 12 years old. Imagine this. Now look at this, Assam, right? Uh, 12 year olds are getting into drugs, 10, 12 year olds. Now Chira is from there, he's doing a ministry as well there. So he knows, he's, he's first-hand, he's seen it. How can we come up with some a ministry or something to reach out to these people? It's not going to, it's, it cannot be a, a physical, I mean, a natural thing. We think, okay, we'll do it like this. It's not going to work. It has to be from the Holy Spirit. It has to be Holy Spirit-led, Holy Spirit's guidance to launch out a ministry that can help this kind of people. Imagine, 10 years old, my son's age. 10 years is not an age to do drugs. 10 years is an age to play cycle. But you see what the enemy is doing. So different places have these challenges. What about Sri Radha? What about in your place? Chhattisgarh, right? Sorry, Kolkata. Let's go ahead. Everything is there. What is what is the what do you feel is one of the problems that are very prevalent in Kolkata? Like in general, if you look at your city, what do you feel? One of the things. LGBTQ in Kolkata. Wow. Human trafficking also. So uh, like you know, selling children, selling babies. A lot of babies being stolen and sold to, uh, and also like uh, 
child molestation, child trafficking. Okay. Organs trafficking. So, so in the hospitals they take organs and sell it. Oh, it's really disheartening. But all of this is happening, and this is all the enemy. Right? Imagine you go to a hospital in Kolkata, and you admit somebody, and you say you know, he's got a fever, and then next thing you know, he's missing some organs. And the person has passed away, life gone. That's what the enemy does, right? He wants to use all everything that he can because he knows his time is coming close. So we as believers must be spirit led. So what are ways? You know, all of you gave me kind of different answers. Nina is from Bangalore, so I didn't ask. So. Anyone online would like to share? Like, what do you feel at your hometown, Prince? I know you're in Andhra. Anything there? Anyone can share. Anything that you've seen and you know that this is a stronghold in your city. Anyone would like to share? You can share. Those online. Okay. All right. Nobody wants to share. Prince says drugs and murders and politics, all three of them. Okay, <laughs> all right. So yeah. So when we understand this, now we're not glorifying the enemy or see what the enemy is doing, and we're not getting scared of what the enemy is doing. Say, oh man, the enemy is. This is a task that I cannot handle. No. Don't feel that way, right? Don't feel like this is a task I cannot handle. Or you know, don't feel that you're too young that you cannot do it. We can do it, right? We just need to come together, really believe in God, ask God to open doors, right? Remember, the church is advancing. The church is always victorious, right? If God is with us, who can be against us, right? So that should be your attitude. Even as we do all of this natural dynamics, spiritual dynamics, your 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 attitude should be. God is with me. God is victorious. Right? One of the pictures I always have in my mind when I face challenges is the picture of Colossians chapter 2, where Paul is writing and he's saying, he made a public spectacle of the enemy, triumphing over them on the cross. On the cross, when Jesus defeated the enemy, he made a public spectacle. He said, now I'm victorious. Another picture that I have is in Revelations. He says to John, he says, rise up. Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. That means I have the authority. Nobody can take that authority from me. So as his children, all of this may sound intimidating. It may sound fearful. Oh, drugs alcohol, human trafficking, organ trafficking, suicide, so much the enemy is doing. And we may get feel discouraged at times. But that's not the stance we must take. Let's say, in all of this, God, give me a strategy. Give me a plan. Give me a door. Open a door for me that I can go out and minister to these areas. And I know that your power is greater than what the enemy is doing. Right? So when you're assured of that, that is your foundation. It's very strong. Nobody can change it. And so even as we go into the practical aspects, next, next lesson we'll go into uh, church planting and how to get planted, how to church, plant a church. This should be a backdrop that we are victorious in Christ. The enemy is a defeated foe. Yes. There's a lot of demonic activities. There is a lot of demonic work that the enemy is doing. Uh, there are challenges we're going to face, but we are victorious in Christ. When we have that in our mind, we'll be able to look forward with hope. Amen? Right? So we'll stop here. Next class, we'll get into chapter 7, and then we'll get into even chapter 8, uh, church planting. 
how to get started again in in this uh, how in chapter 8 we look at how uh, we look at the practical and the spiritual aspects on planting a local church right right can we just pray and close let's pray father we just want to thank you for this today lord we thank you for these two hours of just learning together lord lord we thank you for your word we thank you for the victory of the cross oh lord that you destroyed the enemy and we are victorious in you lord and lord we just come at each one of us lord no matter what plans we have lord we pray that you will lead us holy spirit you will guide us you will teach us Lord, in every step of the way, Lord, you teach us, God. Help us to depend wholly on you. And we know, Lord, if you are with us, who can be against us? Thank you that we are victorious in you, Lord. Give us open doors for us. Give us the wisdom. Give us the understanding. And help us to know, Lord, that you are with us and no foe can come against us, Lord. We give you all the praise, Lord. We give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'll see you next class. God bless.